Now we're going to talk a bit about some principles for secure protocols or some design principles. So we will start with nonces, which is uh, an abbreviation for number used once uh, to limit the usefulness of uh, these uh, values that are transmitted between uh, parties in the protocols to prevent uh, this uh, record and replay attacks. And then we will uh, go into challenge response protocols, which are an improvement to, to ensure uh, freshness. It has, it removes a lot of the problems that you introduce with nonces. And then uh, finally, we will talk about a change of environment, which is a big problem uh, historically. Uh, there has been a lot of examples where you have a secure protocol which is designed well and it works and it is secure and then um, you, someone wants to use it in totally different context, so in a new environment and then uh, these assumptions that uh, were previously valid are not valid anymore, which means that the security of the protocol uh, is no longer valid and the, the protocol is rendered insecure in this new environment. S but first, let's talk about nonces and uh, we'll start with an example of remote car locks. So instead of the, uh, the designs that they had in the 90s where the car key simply transmitted the serial number of the car and the car made a matching and if it was the serial number it uh, unlocked or locked uh, depending on if it was locked or unlocked already whereas in uh, uh, this case so there you could simply record one of these transmissions and then replay it again and uh, it was useful. So the purpose of a nonce uh, or number used once is to prevent this so that one of these transmissions is only valid once. So in this example let uh, k be the car key and let c be the car and then k uh, lower k, uh, lowercase k here uh, is a key which is shared between uh, the car key and the car and then uh, let n be a nonce here. Then the key simply uh, transmits to the car uh, an identifier k here uh, because there might be multiple uh, keys associated with the car so the car needs to uh, identify which key and then uh, an encryption using this uh, shared key then. And inside the encryption you have the identifier again and uh, this uh, nonce. Now the properties we get here is that yeah we have the nonce for freshness so that if the car has seen the nonce n before then it knows okay this is a replay uh, the car key would not uh, reuse this nonce. And the encryption here is for authentication uh, because no one else knows the uh, secret key here other than a valid uh, car key. And the identifier here on the inside that's uh, simply used to detect uh, correct decryption. Uh, because if you would simply encrypt the nonce, I mean the nonce is a randomly chosen number, so any decryption would provide a, a randomly chosen number, so you need to, to verify that the decryption has been done properly. So that's a slight improvement of the 90s car keys. Uh, of course, it doesn't bring, bring us up to speed to 2019 and future car keys. Yeah, how these protocols should work. Now, one fundamental question here is, uh, how far back should we check these nonces? Because now we just said that the car will check if it's seen this uh, nonce before, and over the lifetime of the car, that can be quite a lot of nonces. So for instance, if we compare with the last nonce, uh, yes, that 
partly solves the problem. However, now you can simply record two nonces, so two messages, and then replay them uh, every other time, and it uh, will uh, work. This actually happened to a prepaid electricity meters system uh, in South Africa, uh, where you could uh, you buy um, electricity prepaid and then you scan this uh, code um, in the electricity meter and then the electricity meter gives you a few more kilowatt hours. Uh, but since this one you know, only checked the, the last nonce, so you couldn't scan the same one twice, uh, you could buy two of these and then you could scan them every other time to get an infinite amount of electricity. Another question is how these nonces are generated. Uh, because obviously if we generate them fully at random like that, we need to check every nonce we have uh, seen uh, forever. And that requires uh, a lot of memory. Uh, another problem uh, is that if someone has temporary access to your uh, hardware token, so for instance, your, say your car key, then uh, that person can generate uh, a number of uh, one-time uh, one uh, tokens with different nonces. So for instance, uh, he can uh, press the unlock key like 10 times and record all those messages. Uh, as long as he's not uh, in the vicinity of the car, so the car also records them. And then later when he doesn't have a key, yeah, he has uh, 10 messages which has valid nonces that the car hasn't seen, so he can unlock the car 10 times without the car key. And uh, this is the case if uh, nonces are uh, generated several randomly. Yeah. So an improvement to, to counter this problem would be to, to use a counter as a nonce. So you increase it every time. So if we take the every time the key sends something to the car, it uses uh, the counter that it remembers from time to time. So it adds one to it and then it uh, remembers uh, its added one here. And then the car would also remember the counter C here and not accept any uh, C prime, which is less than or equal to C. So it must be an increase. So this would prevent the, the previous attack in the sense that uh, as, uh, once the, the crook has generated these 10 messages, as soon as uh, you have your key back and you use it once, then all these 10 would be invalidated. So that's the idea here. Now this, on the other hand, makes checking uh, problematic. So you have to make sure that you don't check for equality here. So uh, check uh, for inequality because otherwise you get synchronization errors. So like you press the unlock key in your pocket and suddenly when you get back, get back to the car, the car key and the car are out of sync. So you cannot unlock your car. Uh, another big problem is that uh, this counter will uh, not be an integer as, or a positive integer as we are uh, normally used to, but it will be an integer modulo something, which means that eventually uh, this one will overflow and uh, we must consider that. And in that situation, we have C plus one, which is less than C. Uh, so it has uh, turned around. So we must ensure that we, we solve these uh, problems properly. Now the challenge response uh, type of protocol, we have um, touched upon that topic before. So consider we have two principles or two entities, A and B here with a shared key K and they have a nonce N. So then uh, A will send the nonce to B and uh, B will reply with uh, some uh, a result, a compute a keyed function of 
uh, n so some value which is uh, dependent on some uh, shared secret the key and uh, this nonce so that's the core idea of a challenge response so the challenge is the nonce here which is randomly chosen and then the response is uh, computed and both can uh, compute this response to to make sure that it's it's correct but uh, anyone who observes this uh, communication cannot later impersonate uh, the entity because it it lacks the the key here so so obviously we need some uh, some requirements on this on the complexity of this function and the key here so that it's not possible to uh, to compute and figure out uh, the key after a, a number of observations so something along the security of uh, in encryption systems so one uh, big problem here that we need to face is man in the middle attacks so consider this example it's easy to tie against a chess grandmaster in postal chess just uh, play against uh, two chess masters two grandmasters and uh, just relay their moves so you play against one as black and as the other as white and then you can simply uh, relay the moves so they are basically playing against each other but neither of them uh, knows that they think they are playing against you so you will look very good uh, when uh, you're you've probably tied uh, these games uh, maybe you're lucky that one one win beats the other and you, know, you have a win but uh, another example is uh, the payment terminal in the supermarket when you pay with your card uh, because that's a uh, man in the middle between you and your card because you are supposed to communicate with your card and give the pin code to your card but uh, this terminal uh, is what you you can use for communication with your card so and uh, the terminal is uh, not under your control so someone else provides that one so it's a possible man in the middle uh, attack Another example of men in the middle is all the routers uh, from you, your, your computer or your phone to your email provider. So they can basically read. So your internet service uh, provider can basically see whatever you're doing. Your phone operator is a man in the middle between you and whoever you call and uh, that person you call, that person's phone operator is also a man in the middle. Uh, between you two so we must uh, protect against this and uh, we can use uh, public keys and digitally signed uh, certificates to achieve this but then we, we simply move the problem because uh, we need to to trust uh, some key to verify these signatures and and where do we get that one uh, in the case of uh, uh, internet we uh, when you download your browser the browser comes with a bunch of uh, public keys that you trust uh, and those are used to verify these digital uh, digitally signed certificates for various web servers uh, around the web so there you get the trust there when you get your sim card uh, from your phone operator and uh, this one has some uh, cryptographic keys uh, already in it so it can uh, verify that it's uh, talking to the to the right uh, phone network and stuff like that but that doesn't protect you from your own phone operator uh, because they are able to to decrypt all of this so it's not end-to-end -end encrypted at least not yet uh, maybe it will will be with uh, uh, 5G or 6G uh, whenever they come around.
So, um, a final, final part uh, of this session is the change of environment. So, con consider the, the banking card system for ATMs. Now, this was designed uh, quite many years ago, in the 80s, and uh, they were designed for a secure environment. So, the ATM was usually located in the facade of a bank, which is a pretty secure environment. And uh, this was used for, for many years and eventually uh, people had the idea, yeah, it would be nice to not have to withdraw cash and uh, pay with the cards directly in the shops. So they took this uh, system and simply made simpler terminals uh, that they put in the stores. And uh, then we had a lot of problems with skimming uh, because now suddenly these, uh, uh, what corresponds to the ATMs are no longer in a trust worthy environment. So the, uh, the shopkeeper can uh, modify these or someone else uh, can modify it without the shopkeepers and uh, knowledge. And thus, uh, we had the problem of skimming where people uh, placed um, readers on uh, these terminals so that when you paid with your card, they got all the information they needed to uh, use to create their own copy or clone of the card and use that for, for payment somewhere else. Yeah, so there we had a perfectly secure system which changed environment and suddenly it didn't work anymore. Uh, another example, uh, which is more subtle, is uh, the hard banking hardware tokens that are used, these uh, devices that you need to log into your online bank and something, uh, things like that. So we have, uh, I have two, uh, two examples here of uh, different approaches. So for instance, Swedbank, uh, they have hardware tokens which are individualized. So you get this token from the bank, and uh, they configure it so it's uh, tied to your identity, so you can't use someone else's hardware token to log in to your bank account. And it can generate uh, these one-time codes, which are uh, nonsense-based, and it can also do challenge response uh, uh, protocols like we, we just saw. Another example from another Swedish bank is Nordea, and uh, they have a not individualized smart card reader, so that one you can use uh, someone else's uh, smart card re reader, and uh, it gets individualized when you insert your payment card. Um, and uh, so in this case, it's your payment card that's uh, the personalized thing. So that one is tied to your you. You can't use someone else's identity uh, payment card. That won't work. Uh, but this system also can generate one-time codes and it can do a uh, challenge response, same as we saw before. Now, uh, there are some problems uh, with this. So for instance, if uh, the card reader and the card are stored together, then maybe the pin can be read from the worn buttons because you enter the pin every time, whereas you enter the other numbers uh, more uniformly for the amounts that you're transferring and so on. So maybe uh, this can be uh, read out. Uh, that's not the main concern. Uh, so the main concern is what's the difference between a terminal in the supermarket and the user's uh, smart card reader that it got from the bank. Well, technically, uh, there is uh, no difference. So in both cases, you enter the pin and uh, then uh, the, this device can basically do the rest. So in principle, this uh, terminal in the supermarket could act just like the smart card reader. So you enter the pin and then the smart card reader has your pin and can do whatever. So it can simply do the operations uh, that uh, you normally do when you log into your uh, online bank, you add an account and you transfer money to that account. 
it's because uh, this terminal would have everything it needs. So all it needs to do is have an internet connection so it can connect to your online bank. Uh, because basically this is a uh, man in the middle. So that's uh, the problem of uh, this payment terminal being a man in the middle between you and your card. Uh, you don't know what uh, it is saying to the card and the card doesn't know what it is saying to you. Uh, so and that's uh, the main issue. Now, of course, uh, we should point out that it's hard to get away with this attack because basically if a shop would do this, they would have to leave the country directly afterwards. And it's highly unlikely that they would uh, get enough uh, money in uh, such a short time so they wouldn't be uh, noticed. So it's uh, very unlikely that anyone would even bother pulling off this attack because it's uh, rather impossible to get away with it. Uh, but it illustrates uh, a problem that could be, uh, could be a problem in other situations. So the, the principle here is uh, to not reuse uh, the same security mechanism for several things. So we, we should have separate mechanisms for separate things and we also need to have a trustworthy interface which doesn't man in the middle us or if it man in the middle middles us, at least we, we know the interface. I mean, we know the device is correct because uh, we got it from a trusted source. So for instance, uh, our, our smartphone or, or something like that and the apps we've installed ourselves, we know we got them from uh, good sources. So a better example is uh, Bank ID, where, which has a trusted interface. It's your, your own phone, your computer, so you know what you've done with it. Uh, well, at least uh, hopefully uh, many people install uh, stuff they shouldn't uh, on uh, uh, their phones. So maybe, maybe not, but uh, technically you can get a phone which is uh, assumed uh, secure when you get it and then install only the bank ID app and nothing else and then you, you won't violate its its integrity. Um, now this uh, phone that will be a trusted interface you can actually uh, trust what it says to you so you know exactly what it's doing uh, and bank ID uh, tells you what it's doing if it's signing in or if it's signing uh, so it has separate mechanisms for both logging in and uh, signing transactions, which means that uh, you cannot uh, be fooled to to use uh, uh, to do something uh, you don't want. So, for instance, in the payment terminal, uh, if you would use Bank ID instead, Bank ID would tell you that you're trying to log into your bank and not pay these 25 kroner for whatever you bought in the supermarket. So you, you would uh, notice immediately that something is not as it should be. Uh, the big problem here is that, uh, of course, this system must be used correctly by the developer, which is not necessarily always the case. So I have observed services where they uh, simply use the login functionality when they should be using the signing functionality instead, uh, which uh, is a weakness. So it, it's better to, uh, to use these uh, properly as they were designed. Now that was everything for uh, this time. Thanks a lot.